book of Proverbs, chapter 6. And here in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, the message this morning that, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, you probably wouldn't hear um, one out of maybe a thousand churches. I don't know, maybe, it depends on what part of the country you're in, I guess. Because what I'm going to preach to you about this morning is is completely out of whack with our generation. And what I'm going to preach on this morning is just so completely opposite to the modern philosophy and the educational system, the um, public school system, the universities of America, and the higher place of higher learning, that it's just, um, it's just no, uh, in no comparison how far what I'm going to preach on than what uh, they teach. And what I'm going to preach to you about this morning is something that's in the Bible, and that's my job, is to preach to you what's in the Bible. And we find here in the book of Proverbs seven things that God hates. Seven things that God hates. Now, boy, ain't that a, ain't that a way for a preacher to talk. Some people think hate's a cuss word. And they think that you ain't, you say, oh, no, we're supposed to love everything. Well, uh, you, you, you just ain't educated, your problem. You just ain't been around. There's some things God hates. And if you read your Bible, you'll find out there's a lot of things God hates. And if he hates them, we ought to hate them. And where you get in trouble is when you start loving things God hates or hating things God loves. And the way you can tell if a devil's in you or not, you start loving things that God hates. And you start hating things that God loves. God, help me now, Mama. God says, love, I love this, I love that, I love righteousness. When you start hating it, you're in bad trouble. And vice versa. In Proverbs 6, verse 16. Proverbs 6 and verse 16. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And here they go. A proud look, a lying tongue. Now, I want everybody to look at this in your Bible. You might not believe it's in there. Somebody besides you doesn't have a Bible, just kind of slug yours over and punch them a little bit. They look, all right, you're looking. Verse number 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devise wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Seven things the Lord hates. Seven things that God hates. Now, I need to ask you again. I'm not trying to be rude, but we do need it quiet. It's very distracting when you're in the back and you're trying to hear and you can't hear. Very important that everybody hear. Seven things that God hates. This is what makes people not like the Bible. The word hate means to feel ill will toward or to despise. There's some things that the Bible said that God despises. Now, there's seven of them here, and I, don't, I may not even mention all seven of them this morning. I thought I might even continue it tonight. But briefly, we're going to look at the uh, things that God hates. You won't find any books in the, in the bookstore written on this subject. You won't go into a Christian bookstore and find a book and the title of the book say, Seven Things God Hates. You ain't going to sell no books with a title like that. Everybody wants it to be, God's power can be yours. Release your faith. You can do it, you know. Prosper, get rich. Now you can sell some books if you write stuff like that. But you write a book and call it Seven Things God Hates, and there ain't many people going to want to buy that. That's why you don't hear television preachers many times or radio preachers preach on 
all seven things God hates. Man, you ain't going to get people to give money if you start telling them God hates this about them and that hate that about them, and, and they're going to feel they have not support you no more if you start talking to them like that. So because our system is run by money, there, you don't hear much about what you're going to hear this morning. That's why you ought to count yourself privileged to be able to come to a Baptist church. You know why? Because an independent Baptist church is one of the few places on earth left where a person can just say whatever they feel like saying and not have to be worried about being censored or stopped or breaking the FCC rules or or criticizing somebody. You just forget all that junk and just say what the Bible says. And you may not be used to it this morning, but the exposure will be good for you. You need your intellect broadened a little bit. And that's why God's brought you here, I reckon, is to, to make you see the other side of the coin so you won't be so narrow-minded. But there's some things in the Bible that the Lord hates. You'll never find this on an album cover. You're not going to see a gospel album release at the bookstore. And it says, Here they are, boy, they... I started saying, Oh, quiz, boy, they... They, I don't, they ain't no telling what they like to be singing, but hey, maybe the king or something. The title of the album, some things God hates. No, you ain't going to see that. That You ain't going to see that on an album cover. You're not going to see that. You're, you're not going to be going down Interstate 40 unless you make it. And you might be, you're not going to be going down Interstate 40 and see a great big signboard. And it said, these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to Him. And have these things listed. You're not going to see it. You're not going to see it in a public school. You're not going to see it in a college. You're not going to see it in a in a dormitory. You're not going to see it in a gymnasium. You're not going to see it in the courthouse. You're not going to hear what you're hearing this morning hardly anywhere except in church. That is, uh, church is one of the few places where we're not prejudiced against the Word of God, that we still don't, uh, we don't believe it, and that we still believe what it said. You're not going to hear it on television. I mean, Phil Donahue is not going to get on his program. I'll guarantee you. He's not going to get on that and say, now we have Professor so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and we're going to be talking to all you ladies that ain't got nothing else to do or you wouldn't be here. We're, we're going to he- be- talk to y'all about seven things God hates. First of all, let's talk about proud look. How do you ladies think about it? God hates that, don't he? You'll never hear you talk like that. You never will. And you'll never hear uh, uh, them talk about it on Hee Haw. But J.R. is not going to tell about it. They're not going to tell about it on Dynasty. They're not going to talk about it on the soap opera. I mean, a girl's not going to get out on the soap opera and say, Am I doing something here that God hates? Oh, Lord, please forgive me. If I, they ain't going to do that, brother. You know why? Because they're on the other side. They're not on our side. Brother, they're not scoring points for Jesus. They're scoring for the devil. Well, I tell you, well, I'm in business of scoring points for Jesus, and I want to get in a good lick while I got a chance this morning. Amen. I'll tell you about seven things God hates. You'll never hear it on TV. They're too narrow-minded to talk about it, and they always talk about us being narrow-minded. The truth is. We, we talk about it all. We just don't believe but certain parts of what they try to preach. And so this morning, let's talk about it. Ready? Seven things God hates. Now, you ain't going to like this or some of these things in your life, and you'll have to do like I did. Repent, brother. That's the only way out. Number one, a proud look. God hates a proud look. Now, you can't tell people that in our generation. We are taught to act just as proud as we can possibly act. I mean, when I was in high school, and you kids here that go to high school, y'all know what a proud look. A proud look is when the girl comes in that thinks she's the prettiest girl in the school. And, and people told her that, and she really believed it. And boy, you know, she was a homecoming queen, or she was this or that, and, do that, and she really thinks she's pretty. She really does. Of course, uh, all young girls have a certain amount of natural beauty. That's what they don't understand. All young girls, now it's, I'm trying to be nice to y'all, all young girls have a certain amount of natural beauty, but you start losing it real quick. And boy, you know, here she comes, and she comes down to high school hall, and she makes sure everybody's looking, and she goes, that's a proud look. Now you know what the Bible said about that? God hates it. The Lord looks down and says, I despise that little brat. Walking in there thinking like she's something. That's right. That's what the Bible said. How many people in here believe the Bible's true? Raise your hand. 
All right, you ought to agree with that, brother. The Bible said God hates a proud look. Now, do you know what he can do? Anytime he wants to, he can just flip and just knock her right out of the ring, brother, or, or anybody else. You know, here's old Cassius Clay. He tries to go by another name, but we still call him Cassius. And here he comes in here and he says, you know, talk like a butterfly, sting like a bee, like wild, like cool man. And we're going to do this and that. You know what? God despises such as that. I mean, other God, uh, he, don't, he don't like that. The Bible said, God goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You ain't got nothing to be proud of, and I ain't neither. But listen, you say, well, I'm beautiful. We made you that way. You didn't. If you are pretty, it's God that ought to have the glory. He's the one that gave it to you. And by the way, that's a matter of opinion anyway. You say, well, I'm handsome, but good, and I got muscles, and I'm tough, and I go and I show them how. Well, if you have got muscles, God gave them to you. Amen. God can't stand a proud person. If you're proud this morning, God can't help you. You know, when I first started preaching, I thought, how in the world could I get up in front of people and just holler and scream like that? And to be downright honest with you, I was too proud to do it. And I thought, well, I want people to think I've got good sense. And I don't want them to think I'm just completely off, you know. And, I mean, I want them to think I've got a little bit of IQ and intelligence. You know what? Before God could ever use me, before God could ever use me, I sacrificed my pride on the altar. And I said, Lord, here I am. I make a fool out of myself for you. You said the foolishness of preaching. God, I'll just make a fool. I'll get up and scream hot and spit all over the first three rows. If you can use that and get glory for it, amen. If they like me, all right. If they don't, all right. And you know, I've been happy ever since then. I've been happy because I, it don't really don't matter to me if you like this or not. I mean, I hope you do, but if you don't, I ain't going to lose no sleep over it. You know what? Because I'm not not trying to please you, I'm trying to please him. Now, I heard about this woman, she said, she said, and the preacher preached on pride one morning, and he said, you ought not to be proud, proud. And this woman came to him after church, and she said, Pastor, I've got to confess a terrible scene. She said, I sit in front of the mirror every morning for an hour admiring my beauty. She said, I know I'm guilty of that sin. He said, no, you're not, that's not the sin of pride, sister, that's your imagination. <laughs> Somebody told her that. I heard about one. You know, there's some people that's always, they got to get the credit. they got to get the credit. they got to get the credit for it. And if it does something, they want to make sure everybody knows they did it. And it's a holy spirit. And you know what it goes before? A fall. You show a man that's tough and he's tough and he's this and he's that. And, but he's the toughest one on the football team. And he's all that. I'll show you guys getting ready to break his fool neck. The Bible said the Holy Spirit goes before a fall. One time there's out on a farm, there's this little pond. And at this pond, there was two ducks or two birds uh, uh, drinking the water here and one frog. And one frog lived in that pond and two birds also, big birds that fly around. And they lived in that pond. Well, one day the water started drying up and the birds, uh, they didn't have nothing to drink. The frog didn't have anything to drink. So they said, we're, we're, we're splitting, man. We're getting out of here and find this place where we can find some water. Now, the birds, that was easy for them. They could just fly to another pond. But the frog couldn't. And they said, what, what am I, I going to do? And so one of them said, this, here's what we'll do. They put a stick. And the birds held the stick between themselves. And they said, now you get on here and hold on to it with your mouth. So the frog got a hold of it with his mouth and got a hold of that stick and hung out here. And they took off flying with that stick in between them, that frog holding on right in the middle. And so here they went across the sky over to another pond. And a farmer was out in the field, and he looked up and he said, My, that's amazing. That was, that's ingenious. Who thought of that? And the frog said, I did. <laughs> a holy spirit goes before a fall. That's what the Bible said, brother. God hates proud look. Lord, if it, if it never done us, you know what? 
the most young, handsome, robust, strong. You, you girls exercising, you got your muscles all trimmed up. You're made out of dirt. You're made out of clay, and you ain't got nothing to be proud of. Now, I don't think you ought to just let your body go to flab, and I think you ought to keep it trim and neat and all that stuff. But don't worship your body. There's more important things in life than that. God hates a proud look. Here's a proud look. And here she is, ladies and gentlemen, and she's on her first Oscar or her first Emmy. And she comes down there and she goes... <laughs> And the camera's shining on her, and she just puts that big grin on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the Lord looks down and goes, Black. That's what got that up in heaven. God resisted the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. I want you to know, brother, you know what the devil will do? Now, here's what he'll do to you, Christian. The devil is smart. He'll make a man proud that he's not proud. He will. Some people say, I'm the humblest one in the church. I'm so humble. I just let them walk all over me. And you know what they're doing? They're being proud of how humble they are. Oh! Make you sick kind of listen to them talk. I was in a revival not long ago. And I, after service, those people would come around shaking my hand, you know, and they were doing this and doing that and telling me and enjoying it and everything. And there's this lady, and bless her heart, I think she's a good lady. I don't even know her nothing. But she come running up to me like this. Goes on here and says, uh, uh, Excuse me, I've got to go pray. And I, what'd she tell me she had to go pray for? And then somebody comes up and says, I've got to get home. I, I'm, I'm reading 40 chapters a day now, Brother Danny. And you know, I just wonder a lot of times. How much in our churches, instead of being spirituality, ain't none of those stinking pride. The Lord can't bless that kind of... I mean, you know, they say that God crowns with mercy, but it won't fit a swollen head. If you think you're so great, pick up a newspaper and look at all the help wanted ads and see all the things you're unqualified or too young to do. I'm telling you this morning, brother, the Bible said God hates a proud look. God hates a proud look. You, and I'm not, I don't think a Christian ought to go around like this all the time. Oh, woe is me. I mean, I believe we ought to stand up. I believe we ought to stand up and say thank the Lord and everything. But there's a difference in that old proud, cocky, haughty attitude that a lot of God's people have. I heard about a young preacher, and young preachers are the worst in the world for this sometimes. And, you know, they get to thinking, well, I'm a man of God, and I can tell everybody this and that. And the Lord has to knock them down about 15 notches before He can use them. Every one of them. And you, know, you young preachers, God ain't going to use you until He knocks a fire out of you and something bad happens to you. Or he can keep you, he'll keep you off your high horse. And boy, you know what God done? Uh, his, his, this young preacher went into a church one time and boy, he was fresh out of the cemetery and he got, you know, and he had his message all down, just down pat and he had everything just right and boy, he had his suit on right and he had his words right and his hair was combed and he got up and said, and we, and you started all this stuff and he really thought he was tough stuff. And boy, an old man was sitting back there and he, and he, and he began to preach. It got worse and worse and worse and it just kept getting worse and worse and then finally he messed up and couldn't remember his place and stumbled over his notes and couldn't get his word right and, he, and finally in frustration he just says forget it and closed his Bible and started walking out with his head down like this in frustration and shame and an old man who was sitting near the back of the church kind of pulled him on the coat tail when he went by said come here a minute young fella and he bent over and he said yes sir he said if you'd have gone up like you came down, you could have come down like you went up. And I believe tonight, brother, we will, this morning, we'll never, ever be able for God to use us until we realize that we're nothing. We can do nothing. We don't deserve nothing. I want you to know, brother, I, you say, oh, brother Danny, you know me, you see me right here? I ain't fit to shoot. 
I don't deserve to be in this church. I deserve to be in it. I'm not trying to sound pious, my dear friend, brother. I know I ain't no count. And God never can bless us and use us till we get the pride out of ourselves. Never can. There's a second thing here. God hates. I can see right now, I ain't going to be able to get to all seven of them this morning. You, if you want some more, come back tonight and we'll get all of them, Lord willing. A lying tongue. God hates a lying tongue. You ever know anybody who's a liar? Good night. I can't stand. How many of you here know somebody at school? Somebody, they're just a plain out liar. Raise your hand. Oh, well, we'll pray for the rest of you liars. Okay? Listen, you're just a liar. How many in here has ever told a liar? Raise your hand. Biggest crowd of liars I've preached to lately. All right, listen. Nobody likes a liar. Liar, just old liar. You say, well, I ain't gonna, don't believe a word she says. She lies, she lies, she lies. She comes in school and tells us all these things she does. He comes in at work on the morning and tells about this, this, this fish he caught. It was that long last week. Then it was that long. And then it was that long. And then, you know, he couldn't pull it in. It broke his line. They're just old liars. Just old liars. Some people are chronic liars. They just can't quit. And boy, you know what that thing is? Uh, I when it tells lies, God God hates it. God hates a lying tongue. The Lord looks down and He sees that lying tongue and He says, Ooh, I despise that thing. I despise a lying tongue. God hates a lying tongue. You think, I got about this last night or yesterday evening or sometime when I was studying this. You think about all the lies that's told in the United States in one day. You think now tomorrow will be Monday. You think of all the lies that will be told tomorrow. First of all, McDowell County Courthouse. Now just listen. This is McDowell County Courthouse. First case, so and so, come up here. You were caught on September 13th, BWI, driving while impaired. That means he's drunk or on drugs. And you do this, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get you for this, that. Where were you? You know what he'll say? He'll lie out of it. And the, uh, the officer will step up here and he'll say, I kept, clocked him at 70 miles an hour for this. He said, my, I just looked my speed on him and I wasn't doing that fast. Now, one of them lying, ain't he? And then the judge says this. Says, now, that's just in McDowell County. There are 100 counties in North Carolina. That means there'll be at least 100 court cases all at the same time going on tomorrow morning with somewhere Charlotte and Raleigh and Winston-Salem probably having oodles of them, 30 or 40 going on at once. All of them probably will have lies in them. Somebody going to get up on the witness stand. You swear to tell the whole truth. Whole... Not put your hand on the Word of God. I swear to tell the truth. And get up and lie like a dog, brother. I was sitting on the witness stand. And here they're lying, there they're lying. That's, uh, that's probably about... 75,000 lies that will be told tomorrow morning just in North Carolina. Do you think about Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. That's just in the courtroom. Lies, lies, lies. Then you go over to the sheriff's department. Lies. And you go over to uh, their husbands telling their wife a lie about where they was at yesterday. Or what they're going to be doing tomorrow. Or they told me they going to do this. They did. Lies, lies. And then you go to school. And there's all the kids lying to each other, trying to make each other think they're tough. And then you go out here to the job. And they said, I went out and done this this weekend. And he's lying through his teeth. He didn't do no such a thing. Then you go to the golf course. And here all lie. Then you go down to, uh, hey, I tell you, if you want to hear some lies, go to the trade lot one Saturday. <laughs> There's probably more lies told at a flea market per capita than any other place in the world. You know, there's old coon dogs around there. Oh, that little pup, she ain't six months old. Pull up and look at her teeth, you know. And man, they're rotten about to fall out. And they, they, they'll lie you about them horses. They'll lie you about them rabbit dogs, them beagles, them coon dogs, and blue ticks, and shotguns. Why they ain't been shot? <laughs> All this stuff, you know. What lies, 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 lies. You go down to the used car lot. They'll say, well, here's this thing here. 22 
thousand actual miles. It's a 1962. That little school teacher owned. She never done nothing but drove it back and forth to school. Up to just a mile down the road. Oh, she's a beaut. Yes, sir. Ain't got a bit of bondo in it. Just lying like a dog. You think of all the lies. There'll probably be a hundred million lies told by dinner time tomorrow in the United States. And the heart of God is great. And God looks down. Think of television. Think of radio. Think of all the false advertisement. Lies. Lies. Did you know they say that there's between six and twelve billion dollars a year that Americans blow and spend over a cost simply because the advertisers lied when they sold it to them? For example, they say, um, you know what gets me is potato chips. You buy, I buy a bag of potato chips. I like barbecued potato chips and chocolate cake. Hint, hint. And I, I was just thinking that, they, man, I got a bag of barbecued potato chips and you could mash that thing. And you thought, boy, that's a deal. 59 cents. And you get that thing. And when you open it, it goes pop. And there's about that much potato chips in the bottom of it. Now, you know how they get out of that, don't you? Everybody in here knows how they get out of that. During shipping, the contents of this package may have settled, you know, and all this stuff, you know, and it, it may appear not to be. I wonder how come they don't shake them a little bit before they seal them up. Twelve ounce bag, you know, all this stuff. They say you this, you buy something, you know, you know what gets me? You buy something and it looks like a, maybe it's cologne. And the bottom, that glass is that thick in the bottom. And then the bottle gets littler and littler as it goes all the way up. You could pour what's in there out, man, and it wouldn't fill up a thing. And the big old bottle, that's that high. You know what? They're, they're lying to you. They're making something appear, something that it's not. They say that they, you go down here to the average grocery store, and you take out, it says, one pound of hamburger. Now you take that pound of hamburger, if you really weighed that ever, you'd be surprised how much you get cheated. They took one pound of some meat, a package of meat that somebody bought, and found out they had been charged 30 cent over what the real value of that meat was. But the average person, we don't go in there and buy pork chops or, or hamburgers okay, and take it home and weigh it, make sure we just buy it and fix it up and cook it and take their word for it. A lot of times they're just a line, just a line. And brother, the Bible said in James 3, 8, that the tongue is full of deadly poison like a serpent. I mean, that old tongue boy just lie, lie, lie. And by the way, let me say this. There's no such thing as a white lie. Amen. No such thing. See, somebody said a lie can travel around the world while truth is getting your boots on. What are you using your tongue for? One time D.L. Moody is up preaching and there's a, a woman came up to him after church. She said, I counted 19 grammatical errors in your sermon where you butchered the king's English. And you done this, and you didn't make your pronunciation right, and you didn't use this adjective, this adverb, this all this stuff right. You know, and a lot of times I, you know, how come the reason a lot of times I talk like I talk and don't use proper English? I do that on purpose. I do that to frustrate these people who think that if you don't speak all your words correctly, that it ain't no good to listen to. And ain't ain't right, and you ain't supposed to say it. But you know what I mean when I say it, don't you? Do you know something? She came up to him and she said, 19 grammatical errors in your discourse this morning. He stuck out his tongue and said, Lady, you see that? She said, Yeah, and he said, I'm using that for the glory of God. What are you using yours for? <laughs> Boy, wouldn't it be good if everybody could tame that old tongue? That's one thing that's going to be a blessing about moving in our new church. The altar is going to be about 75 long. Some of you ladies can finally find an altar you can get your tongue on. They say some of them cows can reach around there and lick themselves around the fence. I know some women and some men that can beat that. They can lick their neighbor all around the other side of McDowell County. 
Some people, I believe, when they wake up, man, blah, 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 That's all they know how to do is slap them jaws and run that mouth. And the Bible says, God hates it. Did you know what you can do with your tongue by lying about somebody? You can assassinate their character. You sure can. You can assassinate a person's character by lying about them and talking about them like as a dog. It happens all the time in church. You know why people lie about each other in church? Because they're jealous of each other. You know why preachers criticize other preachers? They're jealous of them. Amen? Y'all listen to me this morning. You know why other churches criticize other churches and start rumors and put down somebody? They're jealous of them. And you, you'd be real smart not to believe about 90% of the things you hear about preachers and churches and God's work. You know, when I first got saved, I hear about some preacher or some church, and I was dumb enough to believe it. Not nowadays, brother. Somebody would come out here and tell me, and they say, I saw the pastor of this church. Hey, I heard he done this and that. I don't pay it a bit of attention. I don't believe it. Even, it might be true, but I don't believe it until I know better. Brother Bob. Let's see. I don't know if we got any Bobs in here or not. Bob, not this Bob. Brother Bob, let's let him be an imaginary character. Brother Bob sings in the quartet at church. He's a good old brother and love the Lord. And he's got a singing group, he and some other folks in the church. No, Brother Bob's a good, fine, upstanding church member. And Bob, bless his heart, he really wants to buy his wife something nice for Christmas and the kids all something, so he works over. And as he comes home, he, he, his, his tie is crooked. He's got his jacket over his shoulder. And he walks up the street like this. Whew. About two hours after quitting time. And you know what happens? Sister Suspicion is sitting on her front porch a rocking in her rocking chair. And there she sits. And there's a big old stack of magazines over here beside her. True secret. It ain't true and it sure ain't secret. <laughs> Modern romance, real love, intimate truth. Oh, man. Talking to me, I stomach that stuff. And there's a big back up in here, and she's been reading all that stuff. There goes Bob walking up the street. Hmm. Bob, I bet I know what Bob's been doing. Bob, he done just what I saw on As the Stomach Turns today. I, I wouldn't doubt it. Poor old Mary. So, she suddenly feels a heavy burden for him and runs the telephone and calls up Sister Exaggerator. She says, Sister Exaggerator, this is Sister Suspicion. I've got a heavy burden I need you to help me pray about. would have more mercy on a pimp. You heard me? I saw a pimp. Yes. Then some of these people run around yak yakking, yakking and destroying churches and sowing discord, brother, and caught starting lies on God's people. Amen? Amen. Well, that's good Sunday morning. Crowd preaching, ain't it? I appreciate y'all. Man, I get thrown out on my ears some places for what I just said. And even if y'all don't like it, you still at least put up with it. And you know what? She called him and said, now, now, sister, I'm not trying to insinuate anything, really. I, I'm not trying to judge, because I don't know. But Bob, he's been going home late an awful lot lately. And you know, I'm not trying to say anything's going on. But it would just it would just break my heart if Mary found out that he was involved with a woman. 
Now, I'm not saying that. Please, don't get me wrong. I think Bob's a fine man. I don't think he'd ever do something like this. But you know, I think we need to really pray for him. By the time Sister Exaggerator got through with it, put on the finishing touches, every woman in the church done knew that Bob was having an affair. Because Sister Exaggerator calls up uh, somebody else and she says, you know, some people think that Bob may be having an affair. Some people. Some people. Ain't that a lie? I mean, you know how some, one person can tell somebody else something and then they'll run, they'll run from one person and they'll run over here and say, you know, some people think. Why, you liar, you. Some people didn't tell you that. One person said it. Some people think Bob may be having an affair. Poor me! You know, he has been awful friendly with the ladies lately. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. Not this day we're living in. Oh, we're the only ones holding out people. That low down Bob y'all this for himself. And every woman in the church found out at prayer meeting that day, week that they had that Bob was running around on his wife. Well, Sunday morning comes. The preacher gets up and says, And now, folks, Brother Bob, the quartet, will come and sing. Here comes Brother Bob in the quartet. Gets up. Bob says, It's a real blessing to be here this morning. Every woman in the church <laughs> drops her head and looks at him like, You lamb. How could you? They look over at Mary and say, <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor man, and start feeling sorry for her. Bob thinks, man, the Spirit's tied in here this morning. And the preacher says, oh, God, what's wrong? Lord, I thought I had the message. God, I thought you were going to bless today. God, and boy, the Holy Ghost grieved away. And the preacher gets up to preach, and it's just like hitting your fist against the wall. And he thinks, maybe God threw with me. I may might ought to resign. Just quit. And there ain't a thing in the world. Them old tongues have been a jawing and a flapping in that church, and they've destroyed each other's confidence in the people. Listen, listen, if, you, if there's somebody in this church running around cutting other people down and causing lose confidence in other people in this church, that's an enemy. You better stay away from them. That's the person you better hang away from, friend. They'll poison your mind. And did you know once you get that poison in your mind, you can't get it out? Even if you find out it ain't true, it's still in there. And every time you see that person, it's hard not to think of what you heard about them. There's some of you sitting there right now. You say, well, I heard this about you, Danny. I heard this. I heard this. I heard this. The only thing I can tell you is come up here and ask God to clean the sedge out of you. Amen. That's the only thing I can tell you, man. It ain't my fault. People don't talk. When people tell me bad stuff about some of y'all, I don't fool with listening to it. Brother Bob tries to shake their hand as he goes out. They look, How could you? And turn around and walk out the door. You know what that, what that verse means? God hates a lying tongue. God hates a lying tongue. Lies. Lies. You hear about that woman that traded in her vacuum cleaner for a telephone? She could pick up more dirt. God hates a lying tongue. Well, there's five more things that God hates. <laughs> I think God, I'll be going to stop right there this morning. If it's the Lord's will, we'll come rest of them tonight. But I'll just leave these with you this morning. There's a lot more down here that we were going to get to a part of it that would deal with everybody. God hates a lying tongue and a proud look. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I guess everybody in here has been affected by pride and lying. And you say, good night, Brother Danny, you made me feel like a dog. I'm guilty of all that stuff. 
Well, my purpose is to help you to see it and help you to get it confessed so the Lord can bless you. There may be somebody here this morning that you're not even saved. And the only reason you're not saved is because of your pride. You're too proud to come down to an altar. You don't want nobody to see you down here praying. You're not going to walk down there and get on my knees in front of all them people. Yep, that's exactly what will send you to hell too. You're too proud. You're too cotton-picking, stubborn, and proud to let God Almighty help you. You know what some of you need to do this morning? Come down off your high horse. God, I ain't nothing. I don't deserve nothing. Never will be nothing if you don't help me. I'm going to get down on my knees on that altar this morning and get my life right. Heavenly Father, do what needs to be done in this invitation. There may be someone this morning that's not even saved. And the reason they're not saved is because their pride keeps holding them back. Dear Lord, please speak to their heart. Help them to realize that they've got nothing to be proud of except what you've done for us. Help them to come to this altar. Maybe there's somebody here with a lying tongue. Oh, God. Oh, God. Help them this morning to confess it from now on tell the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to...